Hi, thanks for joining us for our midweek Bible study here at Family of God Community Church. This is Nate. Nate became a Christ follower two weeks ago and is still a bit giddy about it. Now he's trying not to do cartwheels in public. Nate became a believer partly because of Kim. Yet oddly enough, Kim and Nate have never met. Now is this possible? Well, let's take a look. Kim loved Jesus from an early age, and in college she had a huge impact on her friends. While most of her peers used their college years to, well, experiment, Kim didn't. She remained committed to her faith, and it showed. It especially showed to Lisa, her roommate, who confessed to Kim that she wanted whatever it was that made Kim so strong. Kim shared her faith with Lisa, and Lisa believed. Years later, at Lisa's first real job, she met Thomas. Thomas was hit by a drunk driver when he was 13 and still carried a lot of anger and bitterness. Thomas and Lisa became friends, and it wasn't long before he started going to church with Lisa and her husband. After a lot of studying and searching, Thomas gave his life to Christ. Fast forward a few years. Thomas became a public speaker and was often asked to speak at large events. See, when he became a believer, Thomas developed a new perspective on life. He stopped resenting what had been taken from him and started being thankful for the second chance he had been given. On one particular day, Thomas shared about overcoming hardship and what it means to choose joy. He was so passionate that a number of people were inspired to share a link to his video. The video of Thomas inspired James, too. And if anyone needed inspiration, it was him. James had a ton of issues. He spent most of his life as a passive husband, an absent father, and a horrible friend. That said, no one disliked him more than he disliked himself. But everything changed the night he happened to watch Thomas online. Something clicked and he knew what he had to do. He surrendered his miserable life to someone greater, and he was forever changed. James fought hard to make up for the lost years with his family. And he also began working with young men who were in danger of throwing their lives away. One of those men was Nate. Nate didn't really know his own dad, and he had no real direction in life, ultimately bouncing from one bad decision to another. Because of that, he often found himself in trouble with the law. No one had ever showed him what it looked like to be a real man. That is, until he met James. James became the first father figure Nate ever had. He learned about honesty, self-control, humility, and integrity, and where those traits come from. Two months later, Nate publicly declared his belief in Christ. And of course, James was there. Now you can see the connection. Nate was impacted by James. He was influenced by Thomas. Thomas saw an uncommon joy in Lisa, who learned of Jesus from Kim. Kim's relationship with God eventually led to Nate's. Funny how these two people have never met and never will. Hi, thanks for joining us as we finish this series on Thy Kingdom Come. We've looked at a number of different things. We've looked at the elements that surround the signs of the times. We've looked at the next great event in prophecy. And tonight we're going to conclude by looking at what then do we do? What are we supposed to be doing in light of the fact that Jesus is coming again? And so that's where we're going to go tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this evening, this time together. May you bless and encourage our hearts and teach us. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What then do we do? Passage of Scripture in John chapter 9 and verse 4. Jesus had just healed a man who was blind. And the disciples were looking at him as he has done this great work. And he turned to them and he said, While it is day... We have to do the works of him who sent me. The night comes when no work may be done. And he didn't say, I have to do the works. 
He said, we have to do the works. The implication being that the disciples were to continue the work and the ministry of telling people about the kingdom of God and that it would be coming. And so we have the responsibility to do the works of him who sent Jesus Christ into the world, who is God the Father. So we're supposed to be doing some things then with relationship to Jesus Christ while we wait for him. Now, the scripture says we are to watch for him. There are several things that we can do while we're doing the works and waiting for him to come. One of the first things we're supposed to be doing is watching. We need to be watching for him. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in the first two verses, it says, when is all this going to happen? In other words, when is all of this going to come together? When is this return of Christ going to be? He says, I don't really need to say anything to you about that, dear brothers, for you know it perfectly well that no one knows. No one knows the exact time or the day. That day of the Lord will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. And so we're supposed to be just watching for him to come. Number one, we are to watch soberly. We're supposed to be watching soberly. In continuing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 to 6, it says, But dear brothers, you are not in the dark about these things, and you won't be surprised as by a thief when that day of the Lord comes. You're not going to be caught off guard. Remember, that's what we've been talking about. All the signs of the times, all of the elements that lead up to the event, the great rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. He says, you're not going to be caught off guard. You're not going to be surprised. When that day of the Lord comes, for you are all children of the light and of the day. Remember, he said, we need to be working while it's still day because the night's coming when no one can work. And so he says, you're children of the light and of the day and do not belong to darkness and night. So be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Watch for his return and stay sober. We're supposed to be watching soberly. That word in the Greek is the word nepho. It means to be clear-minded, to be right-minded. You say, I thought sober meant that we weren't drinking. It's more than just to not be drunk. We are supposed to be sober in the sense that we are clear-minded about these things, and we're right-minded that we are living our lives in that context, but we are to watch for His return. That's one of the most important statements. How then are we being sober-minded? Well, <clears throat> the next few verses give us an example <clears throat> of what it means to be sober-minded. <clears throat> Continuing verses 8 and 9, he says, But we belong to the day, therefore let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love. We need to be living a life that's filled with faith that's filled with love because God is love and we are to love one another. We are even to love the uh, enemies that we have in our lives. We're to especially love the lost. So he says, put on this breastplate. This is how I watch soberly. I put on the breastplate of faith. I'm living in faith before God. I put on the breastplate of love. I am loving in my life. And then finally, it says, and put on for a helmet the hope of salvation. The hope that we have because of Jesus Christ, this hope that we carry with us, that's how we watch. We don't watch in fear. We don't watch negligently. We watch in hope because we have salvation in Jesus Christ. The Bible says, For God has not appointed us to incur His wrath. He did not select us to condemn us, but that we might obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. In other words, some people are looking to the future or they're even looking at the circumstances now and they're going, Woe is me! I'm, I'm, this is a terrible time. God's judgment is on us. Let me tell you something. He says, Don't think that way. Put on a breastplate of faith. Put on the breastplate of love and the helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to incur his wrath. He didn't do that. Yes, we may endure some problems and suffering, but it's nothing compared to what that great day of the Lord will bring. And so he says he didn't 
select us, to condemn us, but that we might obtain his salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so that's, we are to be watching soberly. And this is how you watch soberly. Secondly, we are to be watching hopefully. We mentioned that word hope in that previous verse. But we're supposed to be watching hopefully as well. In Romans 8, 24 and 25, it says, We were saved with this hope in mind. That's the word el peace. It means to be sure, to be confident, to have a positive expectation of good things. So we were saved with this hope in mind. If we hope for something we already see, it's not really hope. Who hopes for what can be seen? But you and I, we hope for what we don't see. We eagerly, guess what? Wait for it with perseverance. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But we watch hopefully. Scripture says also in 1 Peter 1 verse 13, Make your minds ready and keep on the watch. Keep on the watch. Hoping with all your power for the grace which is to come to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, when he reveals himself to us uh, in person, when he blows the trumpet the shout of the archangel, and we in the church will be going up to live with him forever in heaven. He's going to reveal himself to us. So we're to be watching hopefully, hoping with all of our power. Here's a third way we are to be watching. We're to be watching obediently. I had a friend years ago, he said, Obeying is doing what you're told, when you're told, with the right attitude. And I agree with that dis that description of what obedient is. But we look in Revelation chapter 3, and Jesus was speaking to the Christians in Sardis. And he says, I know your deeds. Uh, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. He says, wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. There are churches like that all over the world. Oh, they think they're alive, but they're dead as a knit. They don't tell anybody about Jesus. They don't preach the Word of God. They don't live their lives in such a way that it reflects the, the morals and the values that are found in God's Word. They don't do that anymore. These churches may think they're alive, but they're dead. And here's what he says about the people at the church of Sardis. And he says, you need to understand, I've not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Oh, a lot of churches do great things, but they're not doing the main thing. The main thing is reaching people for Jesus Christ, preaching the gospel, letting them hear about the wonder of the word of God, and receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They're not preaching the word in truth and with power. They're not doing any of those things. He says, remember, therefore. Go back to where it was before. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it. Obey it. Remember, doing what you're told, when you're told with the right attitude. Obey it and repent. Some people claim they believe in God, but they don't believe God. And I talked about that a little bit last week. To obey it means you accept God's word at face value. There are a lot of people that do not believe in the word of God. And the apostle John said, if you say you love God, but you do not obey his word, you are a liar and the truth of the gospel is not in you. You need to do something about that. You need to obey God's word and repent now, this word repent uh, in the Greek is the word metanoneo, <clears throat> and it literally means to change your perception, change your direction, uh, to reconsider where you are so that you can go the right way. He says, I want you to obey it and repent, but if you don't wake up, I'm going to come like a thief, and you will not know what time I will come to you. Let me tell you something, dear friends. When the rapture occurs and the believers in Christ are caught up into the air, there's going to be a lot of people sitting in churches going, what happened? What's going on? There'll be a lot of pastors standing in churches going, where did everybody go? What happened to that church over there? And they will begin to understand, hopefully, that he came like a thief in the night. 
So we're supposed to be watching for him. Here's the second thing. We are to wait for him. The scripture here says in this passage in James chapter 5, Meanwhile, friends, wait patiently for the master's arrival. And then he gives an illustration. He says, you see farmers do this all the time, waiting. That word waiting, edekomai, it means to look expectantly. In other words, man, I can't wait. Um, my grandmother, when I was growing up, she loved when the mailman came. And she knew about what time he was to come. And she would often go out on the porch and stand there. And I would say, what are you doing? She says, I'm waiting on the mailman. That's waiting, waiting expectantly. And when he finally came and he put some things in the mailbox, boy, that was an exciting time. She'd say, run down there and get that for me. And I'd run down to the mailbox and, and open that and get what was inside. My wife and I had opportunity to drive by the old farmhouse uh, this past year. And as we drove past uh, the old farmhouse just to look and see that I could remember uh, two significant things. One, the big tree there that we used to play on and swing is right there in the yard where it always was. And across the road is that same old, huge, rusted mailbox. It's there. It's still there. We're supposed to be waiting, just as my grandmother did, just as farmers wait for the valuable crops to mature, patiently letting the rain do its slow but sure work. He says, be patient like that. Stay steady and strong. Why? The master could arrive at any time. You and I need to take that to heart. So we're to be waiting for him. Now, here's two things that we can do as we wait. We are to wait serving him. In other words, while we're waiting, let's not just sit around and twiddle our thumbs and look up. We need to be serving him. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 7, now you have, and this is an important verse of scripture, dear friend. You need to take note of it. You have every grace, every gift of grace, something that God bestows upon you. That in, you have every blessing that God has for in store for you. It's already there for you. You have every spiritual gift that God intends for you to use in service and every power for doing His will. They are yours during this time of waiting. There are a lot of people that sit around and spiritually they are duds. Why? Because they don't get it. They don't understand. You have every grace, every blessing, every spiritual gift, every power for doing His will during this time of waiting. You and I have been given everything that we need to be serving Him until the return of Christ. So we're here to be waiting while we're serving. Secondly, we're to wait honoring Him. In our lives, we need to honor Him. Now, the Bible says in the last days there'll be a great falling away, and I have seen it. I have seen that people are no longer as committed as they once were to worshiping God, to, to truly being a part of a family of God, a local church. We see that all around us. We are to be honoring Him. Why? Because the Scripture says our citizenship is in heaven. In other words, I am a citizen of heaven. And we eagerly, eagerly, the scripture says, await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his coal control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And so since we're going to be like him, our whole process down here is honoring him with how we live our lives. Our citizenship is in heaven. We need to start acting like it's in heaven. We need to start really focusing on how we represent Jesus Christ in this world. How do we represent Him? We honor Him through any number of ways, but I'm not going to go into all of those because I'm going to deal with some of them now. But I want you to understand, we're to be watching for Him. We're to be waiting for Him. Wait and serve Him. Wait and honor Him. And then the third thing, we are to win for Him. 
The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. That word wins is the word laka in the Hebrew, and it means to take hold or reach out and grasp. You and I need to be about the process of reaching out, trying to get people to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. To win souls is a wise thing to do. So how are we to be wise? How can you and I be wise in the winning of souls? Well, number one, we can win souls through worship. Yes, through worship. That's the reason the scripture tells us to bring them in, invite them in, that my house may be full. You are supposed to be bringing them into the house of God because souls are won through worship. Many a person has come to church and been filled with the Spirit of God that they might receive Him. The Spirit has touched them, convicted them of their sin, and convinced them that there is hope for them through a Savior whose name is Jesus. And you and I can win souls through worship. And yet, in this day and age, people are falling away from worship church, worship services, going to church. They fall away from all of that. Why? Well, the scripture says that's just going to be the natural thing in the last days. So you and I, we have to start being sober. We have to start watching. We have to start waiting while we're serving and honoring him. But we can win souls through worship. It is a powerful medium to reach people for Jesus Christ. In this passage in John chapter 12, Jesus said, If I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. If I'm lifted up, I'm going to be lifted up. What do we do when we sing of him, when I preach about him? We're lifting him up. We're presenting him before everyone. And he says, I will draw them to myself. Has nothing to do with the song we sing. Has nothing to do with Howard Edmondson. It has to do with Jesus. And Jesus builds his church and he draws people unto himself. But if no one worships how will they come to know Christ? How? Worship is a powerful agent. In Psalm 96, the psalmist tells us a wondrous definition of what worshiping is. He says, sing to the Lord a new song. Uh, sometimes we get caught up in, in doing the same old routine, the same old thing all the time. You know, in some churches, they sing the same song every Sunday, every Sunday, every Sunday. Uh, I had a situation where I talked to a gentleman about that, and uh, and they had sung this song at church for over and over and over and over. And I asked him, I said, how long how long you been singing this song in church service? I notice you sing it every week. How long you been singing it? He said, hmm, I recollect it must be about 50 years now. I looked at him and I said, Jesus is tired of it by now. <laughs> we need to sing some new songs. We need to sing songs that lift up the Lord. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless His holy name. Proclaim the good news of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations. His wonders among all people. For He is the Lord. He is great and greatly to be praised. He is feared above all God. You say, what is worship about? Well, it's about singing to Him. Even the new songs. Sing to the Lord all the earth. And it says, sing to the Lord and bless His holy name. Do we sing about His name? Yes, we do. Do we proclaim the good news of His salvation? Yes, we do. Do we uh, declare His glory? Yes, we declare His glory. Do we declare His wonders? Yes, we declare His wonders. Do we let people know He is great and greatly to be praised? That's a clear definition of what it means to worship. And when you enter into that circumstance and situation and people are there, they cannot help but be enthralled with the things that God is doing in and through worship. You say, wait a minute. Worship is powerful. Worship does something unique. You bet. You probably have no idea how powerful Worship is. Worship changes people's hearts and minds. Worship washes away all of the worries of the world and the weak. 
and replaces it with a clear presentation of God and Jesus Christ. It is important that we understand the power of worship. In this passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, Jehoshaphat and the people of Jerusalem, they were facing insurmountable odds. They had three nations who had come against them at once. They were coming from all sides. And God had spoken to Jehoshaphat, and he had spoken through the prophets and the leaders who were there. And they came to Jehoshaphat, and they said, God's going to give us this victory. God himself said to Jehoshaphat, I'm going to give you this victory. But we need to praise the Lord uh, that he has given us this victory. So Jehoshaphat, the king, he went out and he chose men to be singers to the Lord. He went and got a choir. Now he chose men because women did not go out into battle, but he chose men from among all the warriors and, and, and the ones that were there and the priests. He chose men to be singers to the Lord, to praise him because he is holy and wonderful. And he didn't put them at the back and he didn't put them in the middle. He put them right up front. They marched in front of the army and they said, thank the Lord because his love continues forever. Uh, give, you know, we, the, the old King James would have put it this way. We give thanks unto the Lord for his mercies endure forever. His love endures forever. And the scripture says, as they began to sing and praise God, the Lord set ambushes for the people of Amnon, Moab, and Edom who had come to attack Judah, and they were defeated. Do you know what happened? They're out there singing and praising the Lord. And you know the people behind them are joining in. All of those mighty warriors, it's like a great voice. They began to sing and praise God. And as they began to do that, the scripture says that the, the people of Amnon, Moab, and Edom, all of these different uh, warriors that had come against them, the Lord sent a great ambush of confusion among them. And they actually began to fight one another. And ultimately, God gave the nation of Israel the victory. And they didn't have to even fight. Isn't that a beautiful illustration of the power of worship? You know what? Sometimes worship is the thing that reaches people's hearts and souls in ways that we cannot. It is a powerful medium. So we can win souls through worship. That's the reason I tell folks all the time. Invite them to come to church. Invite them to come to church. You say, well, they might not like it. Well, it doesn't matter. It's an opportunity for them to hear the gospel, to be touched by the wonder of worship, and to really come to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. A seed will be planted. Even if it doesn't get reaped by your church, it will be reaped eventually. And so I want you to remember that. Invite people to church because we can win souls through worship. Here's a second way. We can win souls through intercession. Now, intercession means very simply that we are praying for another person. We're, we're praying on their behalf. Maybe if they're not believers, they're not going to pray because the first prayer that will be heard seriously is the prayer of salvation. But we can pray for them because we are prayer warriors. We are the ones who have this responsibility as believers to reach out and begin praying for others that they might come to know Jesus Christ. On our prayer sheet every week, there are people that need Jesus and we lift them up. You have folks in your family and your friendships, uh, people who are in your community or your circle of care that you pray for that they would come to know Jesus Christ. And this is important because we can win souls through interceding for them. Let's look at a few verses of Scripture. <clears throat> the Scripture tells us, and Paul was talking to young Timothy, he says, I urge you first of all to pray for all people. He was writing to them there. He was the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And he says, I want you to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. And he said, everybody, he said, even the, the community leaders and those who are evil and ungodly, it doesn't make any difference. You pray for them. 
And then he concludes by making this statement. He said, this is good when we do this and pleases God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. You see, intercession is the key that leads them into that process where they will be soft and open to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how important prayer is. In Romans chapter 8, the scripture says, even the Spirit intercedes for you and me. Intercession is an important part of the believer's life. The Spirit prays for us. The scripture says, likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. That's God, Jesus, the Father, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. In other words, the Holy Spirit is constantly interceding for you. You need to be interceding for the lost. The Bible tells us that Jesus intercedes for us as well. In Hebrews 7 and verse 25, it says, Therefore, because we have received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, therefore He is able to save completely those who come to God through Him, because He always lives to intercede for them. He intercedes for these people. He intercedes for you and I. So intercession is a significant part of reaching people for Jesus Christ. One of the saddest passages of Scripture is found in Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30. The nation of, I of Israel had divided and been carried away and the southern kingdom had become uh, just horrible. The city of Jerusalem had turned its back completely on God. And uh, God is speaking through Ezekiel and he says, I looked in vain for anyone, anyone who would again build again the wall of righteousness that guards the land. Did you ever think about that? There is a wall of righteousness that guards the land around us. Someone who could stand in the gap and defend you from my just attacks. God doesn't want to discipline. He didn't want to discipline Israel at that time, but no one was standing in the gap. No one was building that wall of righteousness. Oh, there were a few that tried, and they were belittled, cast into pits and prison. Many of them were taken aside, and, and the scripture says some were sawn in two, some were treated most horribly. In, in the gospel, in Matthew chapter 5, it says many of those who uh, were prophets and came to proclaim the word of God, who wanted to build the wall of righteousness around the nation of Israel, around Judah, around Jerusalem, that they were just persecuted unmercifully. In Hebrews chapter 11, it says they persecuted them, they, they killed them, they cast them aside, and the world was not worthy of them. But here God says, I looked in vain. This was a time period. He said, I looked in vain for anyone who would build again the wall of righteousness that guards the land. You have to understand Ezekiel, uh, as he's presenting this, he is in captivity himself. He said, who's over there? Who's in Jerusalem to do that? Who could stand in the gap and defend you from my just attacks? But I found not one. Not one person who would stand in the gap. Not one person who would intercede on behalf of the land. Third, W, I, will worship, intercession, S, wise. We can win souls through spiritual warfare. This is important. In Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 12, the scripture says, Last of all, I want to remind you that your strength must come from the Lord's mighty power within you. It doesn't come from us. Some people say, I can't stand up against things. It's not your strength, but his strength. You must be reminded that it is not your strength, but the Lord's mighty power within you that makes the difference. 
And he says, put on all of God's armor so that you will able to stand safe against all strategies and tricks of Satan. For we are not fighting against people made of flesh and blood. And this is important to understand, dear friends. And it grieves my spirit a little bit. And yes, we all get frustrated with politicians from time to time. But it's important that we remind ourselves that it's not people. We are not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against persons without bodies. The evil rulers of the unseen world, those mighty satanic beings and great evil princes of darkness who rule this world and against huge numbers of wicked spirits in the spirit world. You ever wonder why... There seems to be such an, an exponential increase in just ungodly evil in our world today. You ever wonder why there's so much elements that create fear and mistrust? You ever wonder why now, more than probably any other time in history, there is a tremendous effort to suppress the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Why? Well... Satan knows that his time is short. You see, if you don't see the signs of the times, he does, and he knows his days are numbered. Just like the handwriting on the wall before Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belteshazzar, it says, many, many tekel uparsin. You've been weighed in the balances and you are found wanting, and your kingdom will be taken from you. Because when Jesus finally establishes his kingdom here on this earth, Satan, all his minions, and all of those who followed him, they'll be gone, and it will be thy kingdom come. You see, Satan knows that. He knows that time is short. So you and I, we need to be engaged in spiritual warfare. And yet I've seen too many Christians focused on focus their attacks against individuals, against people who are flesh and blood. But that will not work, dear friends. We need to pray a hedge around those in authority. We need to intercede for them because they are under the direct influence of a satanic force unlike the world has ever seen. The Bible says, uh, continuing in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Chapter 10, verses 3 to 5, it says, We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons. You say, what are God's mighty weapons? Well, God's mighty weapons are prayer, worship. We talked about this, worship and intercession. We talk about how that we are loving we demonstrate our faith. There are any number of things that are God's mighty weapons. But they're not worldly weapons. And we use them to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning. Uh, my wife said, uh, one of the most significant things that stands in the way of simple faith is man's intellect. <laughs> he wants to He wants to just reason his way through and out of everything. But the Bible says that man's wisdom is foolishness compared to God's. But here we have these weapons that we use to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. Or there's a lot of them. I dealt with that this last Sunday a little bit. You can go back and watch that message if you didn't get to see it. Then it says, We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. That's how powerful you and I are. We capture the rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. That is spiritual warfare. How important is spiritual warfare? Well, look at this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Satan, who by the way is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're not able to see the glorious light of the good news, the gospel, that Jesus died for them, was buried, and rose again. They're blinded. 
they don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made the light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We are the light of the world. And when we shine, when we let Jesus shine through us, we are preaching and teaching about Jesus Christ. It breaks through that blindness and that darkness that Satan has put in the minds and the hearts of those who do not believe. Very important to be engaged in spiritual warfare. So we have W, worship, I, intercession, S, spiritual warfare, and then finally E, evangelism. Evangelism comes from the word, root word eulogias, which means the good news. It is reaching out to people with the good news of Jesus Christ. In other words, we need to be telling them. At the end of Jesus' earthly ministry here, it says he came to the disciples and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, because I have been given all authority in heaven and in earth, go and make disciples of all nations. To become a disciple of Jesus Christ means that you receive him as your Lord and Savior. He becomes your master, and you begin to live in the disciplines of the master. So we need to be making disciples, immersing them, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, getting them into the life of the church, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, teaching them the Word of God about the God of the Word. And he says, when you begin to do that, he says, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And that's what we've been talking about. This age, this time of the church, it's coming to an end. And he is with us to the very end of this age. We win souls through evangelism. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 to 5 says, For there is going to come a time when people won't listen to the truth, but will go around looking for teachers who will tell them just what they want to hear. Now, there's two groups of people that we look at. There are those who are totally unbelievers. They are unbelievers. They don't have Jesus in their heart and life. They don't even go to church. They have nothing to do with God. And you know what? They listen to the voices of those in the world who are evil and ungodly. They listen to them. But then there are people in churches who are there and they begin to listen. And let me tell you something. There's a lot of preachers out there who do not know Christ and do not know His Word and they are boldly proclaiming the things that are evil to their congregations. And what's happening is, is they want to hear the message the way they want to hear it. Oh, they want to refer to themselves as being Christians. They want to be good members of their church, but they don't want to hear the truth. So what do they do? They gather leaders or teachers or preachers around them who will tell them just what they want to hear. And they won't listen to what the Bible says, but will blithely follow their own misguided ideas. He says, don't do that. Stand steady. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. There are people that are starting to stand up in churches all over uh, the world who are saying, no, we're not listening to this. No, we're not going down this path. No, what you're teaching is not what the Bible says. No, I want people to come to know Christ. And so, they're standing steady. It's one by one by one by one here and there. He says, stand steady. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. He say, but my friends will hate me. They'll reject me. Stand strong. Don't be afraid of suffering because that's what it is. Just as they rejected God's servants in the past, they might reject you now, but stand steady. Don't be afraid and bring 
others to Christ. That's evangelism. Bring people to Jesus Christ. In Romans 10, great passage of Scripture about the essence of receiving Christ as their Lord and Savior. I often refer to Romans 10 at the end of the service that, you know, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord and believe in their heart that God the Father has raised him from the dead, they shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's 11 and 12. It says this in verse 13, continuing. It says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then it adds this. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. Dear friend, uh, you have a mandate. You need to go and tell people about Jesus. You need to invite them to come to church so that they can hear. You need to pray for them. You need to recognize that they are not your enemy. They are the ones who need Jesus Christ. You need to be worshiping God and presenting Him in such a way in your life that when people see you, it reflects the light of Jesus in you. You need to be telling people about Jesus. Don't be a secret agent Christian that nobody knows you're a believer. Boldly stand strong. Don't be afraid to be rejected and reach people for Jesus Christ. Very important for you and I to do that. In closing, I want to leave you with this verse of Scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 1. The Bible says God did not give us a spirit that makes us afraid. He gave us a spirit of power and of love and of self-control. So do not be ashamed to tell people about our Lord Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Lord, I praise you and I thank you for your wondrous love. I thank you for your rich blessings. And I praise you for the wonder of the cross. May you encourage each of us this night that we would be watching, we would be waiting, we would be winning people to come to you, Lord. And I praise you for this awesome responsibility that you've given to each of us in light of the fact that you are coming again, and I believe coming soon, Lord. So I pray that you would challenge each believer that they would truly, truly walk with you, witness for you, and win for you. Dear friend, if you've been listening and you say, Pastor Howard, I don't know for certain if I died that I would go to heaven, but I want to know. Would you just pray with me right now? Would you just say these words? Just say, Lord Jesus, I want to be forgiven of all my sin. I want to no longer carry this shame. I want my guilt to be gone. I want to go to heaven one day with you, and I want to know that in my heart. So, Lord Jesus, I place my faith and my future in your hands, believing and trusting that you died on the cross for me to take my place and that you shed your precious blood to forgive me of all my sin. I believe when they took you down from that cross and laid you in a borrowed tomb that three days later you wondrously rose from the dead so that I can have a home in heaven with you one day. And if you have the power to do that, you certainly have the power to save my soul. So Lord Jesus, will you come into my heart and my life Will you be my Savior?
to forgive me of all my sin, to wash me white as snow. Take away all my guilt and shame. Will you be my Lord to lead me, to help me to make good and wise decisions? And will you be my friend to stand with me, to walk with me through no matter what I face in this world, but to one day walk the streets of heaven with you? Now, dear friend, if you prayed that and you meant it with all of your heart, there Romans 10, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart that God the Father raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's important if you did that to let someone know, maybe a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, someone you know that they have received Christ and they bear witness to it that you need to let them know you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you don't have anybody you can tell, drop me a note there at Pastor Howard at familyofgodcc.com. I want to thank you for joining me in this important series as we look forward to thy kingdom come. Beginning next week, we start a new series, Questions About God and Faith. I hope that you'll join us as we enter into this uh, new line of questions. We're going to talk about these important questions that many people have about God and faith that they truly, too, can be looking as they pray, Thy kingdom come. Thanks for joining us tonight. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you to watch over you no matter where you go. And as we leave this time together this evening, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. As always, dear friends, keep looking up.